Welcome to today's update on critical global events impacting international security and diplomacy. In the Middle East, Israel has ramped up its airstrikes following recent Hezbollah attacks targeting Tel Aviv, while the Israeli military prepares for intensified operations against Hezbollah. As the situation unfolds, Israel is returning bodies to Gaza, prompting demands from Palestinians for identification before burial. Meanwhile, the UK is taking precautionary measures, preparing for a mass evacuation from Lebanon amid escalating tensions in the region. Turning our attention to the United States, House Republicans are advancing contempt charges against Secretary of State Antony Blinken related to his testimony on Afghanistan, showcasing ongoing political tensions. President Biden is also set to make a long-awaited visit to Africa in October, with stops in Germany and Angola, emphasizing the U.S. Its commitment to strengthening international relations. In Eastern Europe, the conflict in Ukraine intensifies, with Russian-guided bombs wreaking havoc as President Putin addresses nuclear deterrence amid the escalating crisis. Ukraine continues to urge global leaders to advocate for true peace while uncovering Russia's secret drone program in China. On the defense front, the U.S. and Romania have signed a significant $920 million defense loan agreement, and NATO is strategizing on transporting wounded troops in potential conflicts with Russia. As we look toward other parts of the globe, France is re-evaluating its approach to immigration and security, and the Philippine military is supporting the U.S. missile system in response to growing Chinese concerns. Meanwhile, the mysterious disappearance of an elite economist in China has raised alarm bells domestically and abroad. Join us as we delve deeper into these stories, exploring their implications for global stability and security. Israel escalates airstrikes after Hezbollah targets Tel Aviv. Israel has intensified its airstrikes on Hezbollah in Lebanon following the militant group's first-ever missile attack on Tel Aviv. The missile, which targeted the headquarters of Mossad, Israel's intelligence agency, was intercepted by Israeli forces. This escalation marks the heaviest exchange of fire between the two sides since 2006. Hezbollah, backed by Iran, has launched hundreds of rockets at northern Israel, targeting both towns and military bases. Israeli strikes have killed around 570 people in Lebanon, including children, as the fighting rages on. The conflict is pushing Lebanon to the brink, with the United Nations warning of the risk of the country becoming another war zone, like Gaza. Efforts by the US, Europe, and Arab states to prevent a full-scale Israeli ground invasion of Lebanon continue, as the region faces the threat of a broader war that could draw in global powers like the US and Iran. US President Joe Biden, along with other world leaders, has called for a ceasefire, but negotiations remain stalled. The violence has deepened Lebanon's ongoing economic and political crisis, which has seen inflation soar and left the country in debt default. As the Israeli strikes aim to weaken Hezbollah's capabilities, officials believe about half of the group's short- and medium-range rockets have been destroyed. However, Iran's leadership warns that Hezbollah's strength will endure despite these losses. With Israel signaling readiness for a ground invasion if necessary, tensions are unlikely to ease anytime soon. Both sides seem entrenched and the risk of further escalation looms large. Israeli military prepares for maneuvering in action against Hezbollah. Israel's military is entering a new phase of its ongoing campaign against Hezbollah, according to Major General Ori Gordon, head of the Northern Command. During a visit to Israel's northern border, Gordon emphasized that the military must be ready for maneuvering in action, though it remains unclear if this refers to a potential ground invasion into southern Lebanon. The campaign, which initially focused on weakening Hezbollah's firepower and targeting key commanders, has now reached a point where Israel seeks to further shift the security dynamics. The Israeli military's airstrikes have already delivered significant blows to Hezbollah's capabilities, but Gordon stressed that further operations might be necessary to ensure long-term security. Israel returns bodies to Gaza. Palestinians demand identification before burial. Israel returned the bodies of 88 Palestinians killed during its military offensive in Gaza, but Palestinian health authorities refused to bury them without detailed information. The bodies, transported in a container through an Israeli-controlled crossing, arrived without identification regarding the victims' names, ages, or where they were killed. Health officials at Nasser Hospital in Khan Yunus halted the process, calling on the International Committee of the Red Cross, ICRC, to intervene and obtain the necessary details from Israel. Palestinian authorities stress that proper identification is needed to allow families to bury their loved ones with dignity. 
Under international humanitarian law, the dead must be treated with respect, and families have the right to know about their missing relatives. The conflict in Gaza continues to take a heavy toll, with over 41,000 Palestinians confirmed dead and thousands more missing since Israel's assault began last year, following a Hamas-led attack on Israeli towns. Meanwhile, Israeli military operations in Gaza have not slowed down, with airstrikes killing at least 14 Palestinians on Wednesday. The strikes, which targeted homes in Rafah and Boraj, left families devastated, including women and children among the victims. Israeli tanks also advanced into Beit Lahia in northern Gaza, adding to the growing casualties in the region. Despite diplomatic efforts, the war shows no signs of easing, with Israel continuing its offensive, refusing a ceasefire until Hamas is fully defeated. UK prepares for mass evacuation from Lebanon amid rising tensions. The UK is positioning troops in Cyprus to help evacuate British nationals trapped in Lebanon, as fears grow over the escalating conflict between Israel and Hezbollah. Prime Minister Keir Starmer urged British citizens to leave Lebanon immediately, while commercial flights are still available, warning of the increasing danger. Following Israeli airstrikes that marked Lebanon's deadliest day since its civil war, the UK is sending 700 troops to Cyprus, joining two Royal Navy ships, aircraft and helicopters already stationed in the area. This move is part of preparations for a potential mass evacuation as the conflict threatens to widen into a full-blown regional war. Starmer also called for a ceasefire, urging all parties to step back from the brink and pursue diplomacy to de-escalate the situation. Israeli airstrikes have killed over 560 people in Lebanon, including children, and displaced half a million people. Schools and other buildings are now being used as shelters for those forced from their homes. With Hezbollah firing rockets into Israel in support of Hamas, Israel has shifted its focus to the northern front. The UK's actions are part of broader international efforts to manage the growing crisis in the region. House Republicans move forward with contempt charges against Secretary Blinken over Afghanistan testimony. Republicans on the House Foreign Affairs Committee have advanced contempt charges against Secretary of State Antony Blinken over his failure to appear and testify about the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. This follows months of GOP efforts to hold the Biden administration accountable for the chaotic exit ride, which they have labeled a stunning failure of leadership. The party-line vote of 26 to 25 comes after Chairman Michael McCall criticized Blinken for avoiding testimony. McCall claims the secretary has shown willful indifference and failed to take responsibility for the withdrawal that allowed the Taliban to seize Kabul in August 2021. McCall stated, rather than take accountability, the secretary hides from the American people. While Blinken has testified 14 times on Afghanistan, McCall argues that he has avoided addressing key questions regarding the Republican-led investigation. Blinken, who was at the UN General Assembly when McCall demanded his appearance, expressed disappointment and urged for a good-faith resolution, noting his commitment to testify again at a mutually convenient time. Democrats criticized the contempt proceedings as political theater, with repaying. Gregory Meeks calling it an attempt to drag the Biden administration into negative headlines ahead of the upcoming presidential election. The contempt resolution could eventually go to the full House for a vote, but Speaker Mike Johnson suggested it likely won't be addressed until after the election. This escalation is just the latest chapter in a broader political battle over accountability for the Afghanistan withdrawal, which continues to play a prominent role in campaign narratives leading up to the 2024 election. Biden to make long-awaited visit to Africa in October, stopping in Germany and Angola. President Joe Biden will finally make his long-promised trip to Africa in mid-October, with stops planned in Germany and Angola. This trip marks the culmination of efforts by the Biden administration to strengthen ties with Africa, a key region where the U.S. is looking to counter China's growing influence. Biden had originally pledged to visit Africa during a summit with African leaders in Washington in 2022, but had not yet followed through until now. During his visit from October 10 to 15, he will first stop in Berlin to meet with German leaders, where he will reaffirm U.S. alliances, express gratitude for Germany's support of Ukraine in its defense against Russian aggression, and discuss NATO contributions. The president will then travel to Luanda, Angola, where he will meet with President Joao Lorenzo. Their discussions will focus on economic partnerships, infrastructure projects, and a significant rail project that would link Angola's Lobito port on the Atlantic Ocean to the Indian Ocean. 
The visit reflects Biden's commitment to deepening U.S. involvement in Africa on various fronts. Biden's trip to Angola will make him the first U.S. president to visit sub-Saharan Africa since 2015. His visit is part of an overarching strategy to build stronger relationships with African nations and to demonstrate U.S. investment in the region's future. Despite earlier delays, Biden's trip underscores the importance of U.S.-Africa relations as part of his foreign policy vision. Putin to address nuclear deterrence as Ukraine conflict escalates. Russian President Vladimir Putin is set to chair a critical meeting of the Security Council focused on nuclear deterrence amid growing tensions over Ukraine's requests for long-range Western missiles to strike deep into Russian territory. The meeting will be attended by top Russian officials, with Putin delivering a speech, although most of the details will remain classified. This meeting comes at a tense time in the Ukraine conflict now over two and a half years old. Ukraine has been pressing its Western allies, including the US, to provide long-range missiles like ATAC-MS and British Storm Shadows to hit targets inside Russia. Putin has warned that such a move would force Russia to make appropriate decisions, potentially escalating the conflict further. The war has sparked the gravest East-West confrontation since the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. Putin is now considering Russia's response as the world watches closely. As the largest nuclear power, Russia holds a vast arsenal, controlling 88% of the world's nuclear warheads, along with the US. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky told the United Nations Security Council that peace with Russia cannot come through talks alone. However, the Kremlin strongly disagrees, stating that forcing peace on Russia would lead to severe consequences for Ukraine. With NATO preparing for potential war scenarios with Russia, and Ukraine losing key towns in the east, the conflict has entered a dangerous phase. Putin has warned the West that continuing to support Ukraine risks triggering a global war. Russia is also revising its nuclear doctrine, signaling the increased risk of escalation. Furthermore, the Kremlin is pushing for negotiations to replace the U.S.-Russia New START Treaty, set to expire in 2026, but has indicated that any future agreements must also consider the nuclear arsenals of Britain and France. Russia's Guided Bombs Wreaking Havoc in Ukraine Russia has been intensifying its use of guided bombs in Ukraine, significantly ramping up its attacks. Last week alone, Moscow's forces dropped over 900 of these destructive weapons, targeting Ukrainian forces as well as towns and cities near the front line. These guided bombs, or glide bombs, are conventional Soviet-era ordnance upgraded with wings and satellite navigation, allowing them to extend their range and hit targets with precision. They are cheaper, and more abundant than ballistic and cruise missiles, making them an effective tool for Russia. Weighing between 500 to 3,000 kilograms, these bombs are typically dropped from beyond the range of Ukrainian air defenses. Their destructive power has been devastating, with even fortified Ukrainian defensive positions crumbling under their impact. These weapons played a crucial role in the capture of the eastern city of Avdivka earlier this year, and they continue to be used in various regions, including Kharkiv and Sumy. Recent attacks in these areas have led to significant civilian casualties, with strikes on apartment buildings and a geriatric center. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has been urging Kyiv's Western allies to provide more air defense systems and long-range strike capabilities to counter this growing threat. While intercepting the bombs mid-flight is challenging, experts suggest that, that targeting the Russian warplanes before they drop these weapons may be Ukraine's best defense. A recent Ukrainian drone strike on a warehouse in Russia's Tver region destroyed a stockpile of missiles, guided bombs, and artillery ammunition. Zelensky, currently in the United States with a Ukrainian delegation, is pressing Kyiv's case that Russia must be forced into peace. Ukraine urges global leaders for true peace amidst war with Russia. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is calling on world leaders to support Ukraine and pursue a real, just peace rather than seeking a way out of the ongoing conflict with Russia. Speaking at the UN General Assembly, he emphasized that there is no alternative to the peace formula he introduced two years ago, which demands the withdrawal of all Russian forces from Ukraine and accountability for war crimes. Zelensky stressed that attempts to negotiate a ceasefire or find alternatives are merely efforts to escape the conflict, not genuine resolutions. Do not divide the world. Be United Nations, he implored highlighting the need for global solidarity to achieve peace. As the UN Assembly unfolds, Russia has yet to address the Assembly, with lower-level diplomats filling their seats during Zelensky's address. 
Russian President Vladimir Putin is absent from this year's high-level meetings. The conflict in Ukraine remains intense, with a lengthy front line stretching 1,000 kilometers. Since Russia's invasion in February 2022, tens of thousands have lost their lives. And while Russia has made gains in the east, Ukraine executed a bold incursion across the border last month. Zelensky argued that Russia must be forced into peace and dismissed the idea of engaging in peace talks with Putin as futile. In response, Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov labeled Zelensky's call for compulsion a fatal mistake and warned of potential repercussions for Ukraine. This week, Zelensky is also expected to present a victory plan to U.S. President Joe Biden. Exclusive Report Russia's Secret Drone Program in China Recent reports reveal that Russia has initiated a covert weapons program in China to develop long-range attack drones for use in the ongoing war against Ukraine. According to sources from a European intelligence agency and documents reviewed by Reuters, IEMZ Kupol, a subsidiary of the Russian state-owned Almaz Anti, has flight-tested a new drone model, the Garpia 3 G3, in collaboration with local specialists in China. Kupol has informed the Russian Defense Ministry that it can produce these drones at scale in China for deployment in what Moscow calls its special military operation in Ukraine. However, both Kupol and the Russian Defense Ministry have not commented on these developments. The Chinese Foreign Ministry claimed no knowledge of the project and emphasized strict controls on drone exports. Experts suggest that if confirmed, this drone program would mark a significant shift as previous Chinese support for Russia primarily involved dual-use goods rather than complete weapon systems. The G3 drone has a range of about 2,000 kilometers and a payload of 50 kilograms. Kupol has reportedly received seven military drones, including two G3s, at its headquarters in Russia. The White House expressed deep concern over these developments, noting that they could indicate a Chinese company providing lethal assistance to a U.S.-sanctioned Russian firm. However, they have not found evidence suggesting the Chinese government's direct involvement. The documents reviewed indicate that Kupol is moving towards serial production of drones in China, a significant escalation since the start of the Ukraine war in February 2022. China has denied allegations of supplying weapons to Russia, maintaining a neutral stance in the conflict. Meanwhile, both Russia and Ukraine are rapidly increasing their drone production, which has proven to be an effective weapon in the ongoing war. Russian President Vladimir Putin has claimed that his military received around 140,000 drones in 2023 and aims to increase that number tenfold this year. In the context of this arms race, experts warn that China must tread carefully to avoid severe international sanctions while potentially exposing itself to greater scrutiny regarding its military cooperation with Russia. U.S. and Romania sign $920 million defense loan agreement. The United States is set to sign a $920 million direct loan agreement with Romania to bolster the country's defense modernization efforts. This initiative comes in the wake of heightened security concerns following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. As a NATO and EU member, Romania is committed to increasing its defense spending to 2.5% of its GDP. The nation shares a 650-kilometer, 400-mile border with Ukraine and has experienced incidents where Russian drone fragments have entered its airspace. Additionally, some areas near Romania's border are close to Ukrainian ports on the Danube River, which are frequent targets of Russian attacks. Under the terms of the loan, Romania's defense ministry will receive $700 million directly, while up to $220 million will be allocated to Romarm, a state-owned entity overseeing 15 companies involved in the production of a wide range of military equipment, from gunpowder to guided missiles. This loan is being provided through the U.S. Foreign Military Sales FMS program, with a repayment period of 12 years. Earlier this August, the Romanian government approved a total of $4 billion in direct loan agreements through the FMS, alongside the potential to secure up to $8 billion from financial markets backed by U.S. government guarantees. NATO's plans for transporting wounded troops in a potential conflict with Russia. NATO is preparing for the large-scale transport of wounded troops in the event of a conflict with Russia, with plans to potentially utilize hospital trains for evacuations. This strategy comes from the recognition that air evacuations may not always be feasible, especially given the expected scale of warfare. Lieutenant General Alexander Solfrank, head of NATO's Logistics Command, emphasized that the medical evacuation scenarios would differ significantly from experiences in Afghanistan and Iraq. 
In a potential war with Russia, NATO forces might face a much larger battlefield, an increased number of injuries, and possibly a temporary lack of air superiority near the front lines. Saul Frank noted the challenge will be to swiftly ensure high-quality care for, in the worst case, a great number of wounded. Although he did not specify exact numbers. This planning is part of NATO's broader efforts to enhance its deterrent and defensive capabilities following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The German military has projected that Russia could attack a NATO member by 2029, heightening concerns amidst escalating tensions that echo the Cold War era. Saul Frank leads NATO's Joint Support and Enabling Command, JSEC, which coordinates the movement of troops and logistics across Europe. Recently, JSC conducted an exercise focused on patient transport. Saul Frank explained that medical evacuations would require navigating greater distances than in past conflicts, as Russian air defenses could pose significant threats to air evacuation flights. Consequently, the use of hospital trains may become essential, as they can carry more casualties than aircraft. He stated, air superiority will have to be achieved in the first place. Highlighting that ensuring control over the battlefield would take time, all options for transporting wounded soldiers, including trains and potentially buses, are being considered. Another challenge is the differing medical regulations across countries. Saul Frank proposed a military medical Schengen, which would facilitate the cross-border movement of necessary medications, such as narcotics for pain management, that are essential for treating injured troops. France's new approach to immigration and security. France's new interior minister, Bruno Retailleau, has announced plans to expel illegal immigrants who have broken in to the country. This move is part of a broader strategy to toughen law and order in response to rising concerns about immigration, security, and public safety. Retailleau called for a coalition of EU countries to push the European Commission to strengthen immigration laws, reflecting the growing influence of Marine Le Pen's hard-right national rally, RN, following significant losses for President Emmanuel Macron's centrist government in recent elections. The RN is now tacitly supporting a new coalition led by Michel Barnier, contingent on addressing hard-right concerns about immigration and security. Emphasizing his priorities at the Interior Ministry, Ritello stated, the first is to restore order, the second is to restore order, and the third is to restore order, indicating a strong commitment to enhancing public safety. He plans to unveil new measures aimed at curbing illegal immigration and increasing expulsions of undocumented migrants. He noted, one should not stay in France when one has broken in, and expressed his intention to utilize regulatory powers to strengthen existing laws. In alignment with Le Pen's demands, Ritello has suggested that France and other like-minded European nations should collaborate to urge the EU to toughen its immigration policies. He cited Germany's recent decision to impose temporary border checks as evidence of a shift toward more stringent immigration views across Europe. Ritello is also calling for state prefects from regions with high immigration rates to increase deportations and limit regularizations of undocumented immigrants. He intends to engage with North African nations to prevent undocumented migrants from entering France and has advocated for harsher prison sentences for criminals. Moreover, he expressed a firm stance on addressing radical Islam in France, stating he would not hesitate to close Islamist mosques or expel hate preachers. While Retailo acknowledges the need to heed the message from French voters, who have expressed a desire for more security and less immigration, his remarks have drawn criticism from the left-wing New Popular Front Alliance which labeled him a racist based on his previous comments linking urban riots to third-generation immigrants. Tensions have surfaced within Barnier's government, as Retailo's rhetoric and the administration's alignment with the RN have caused discomfort among Macron's centrist MPs. In a recent incident, Barnier had to reassure Le Pen after a finance minister's comments suggested the RN was not part of the acceptable political spectrum. As the political landscape in France evolves, Retailo is navigating the complexities of coalition politics while responding to public demand for tougher immigration policies and increased security. Philippine military supports U.S. missile system amidst Chinese concerns. The head of the Philippine military, General Romeo Bronner Jr., has expressed strong support for the permanent presence of a U.S. missile system, the Typhon, in the Philippines. This deployment, which has been in place since April, has drawn criticism from China, labeling it as destabilizing. Bronner stated, If I had my way, I want them to stay here forever, emphasizing the importance of strengthening the country's defense capabilities.
He further noted that if funding were available, he would advocate for purchasing the Typhon system to enhance the Philippines' defense arsenal and deterrence capabilities. This missile system has been a point of contention between the Philippines and China, especially amid ongoing tensions over territorial disputes in the South China Sea. While the Philippine Foreign Secretary Enrique Manalo previously indicated that the Typhon's deployment was temporary, recent statements suggest no immediate plans for withdrawal by the U.S., a long-standing ally of the Philippines. During the Asian Defense and Security Exhibition in Manila, Defense Secretary Gilberto Teodoro refrained from confirming whether the Typhon would remain in the country indefinitely. However, he took a stance against foreign interference, implying that other nations, particularly China, should cease their illegal activities in the West Philippine Sea and dismantle their missile capabilities before criticizing the Philippines' defense posture. The Philippines is actively seeking to modernize its military, with plans to acquire 40 new fighter jets to bolster its defense amid escalating tensions with China in the region. Bronner has reiterated the country's commitment to acquiring the latest weapons systems for effective deterrence. Disappearance of a lead economist sparks concerns in China. In a worrying trend, another prominent figure in China has vanished from public life after criticizing President Xi Jinping. Zhu Hengpeng, a leading economist and deputy director of the Institute of Economics at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, disappeared shortly after sharing concerns about China's sluggish economy in a private WeChat group. Zhu, who had held his position at the state think tank for nearly a decade, has reportedly been investigated, removed from his posts, and detained following his remarks. His name has since been removed from the staff list of a think tank associated with Tsinghua University, and his last known public appearance was in late April. The Chinese Academy of Social Sciences and the State Council Information Office have not responded to inquiries about Zhu's situation. His disappearance is part of a broader pattern as President Xi intensifies his crackdown on dissent, particularly against critics within the elite ranks of the Communist Party. Zhu's case follows other high-profile disappearances, including Alibaba co-founder Jack Ma, who went missing after criticizing regulatory practices in late 2020, and former Defense Minister Jen Li Shangfu, who was reported to be under investigation for corruption and has not been seen publicly since August 2023. Reports suggest that many of China's elite, who are also members of the Communist Party, are increasingly at risk due to Xi's aggressive anti-corruption campaign. This has raised concerns about the lack of transparency in detentions, as families are often left in the dark about their loved ones' whereabouts.